So hello, everybody. Uh, this is a panel discussion on green recovery from a pandemic meltdown. So we will see if we have to set a question mark or not. So uh, I want to welcome everybody, particular the audience and uh, Dean uh, Will Milberg and uh, our speakers. I will introduce the speakers a little bit later. Uh, this uh, panel discussion is organized by the uh, CEPA. This is the policy arm of the uh, World Economics Department of the New School for Social Research. And uh, this is uh, very uh, efficiently supported by uh, the CEPA staff, in particular, uh, as uh, director of the, of the uh, CEPA is uh, Teresa Gilatucci, uh, Bridget Fischer, the associate director, and Michelle Altman did a lot of organization of this event here. I also want to mention that the Thyssen Foundation is uh, supporting this event financially. Uh, we had several other events already uh, in the previous years. And uh, I want to say that originally we wanted to take a recent World Bank report that it was done by a SIPA team uh, as a basis for such a discussion, which is not, uh, uh, we cannot do this now because it is only allowed to go into the public in the public domain where once it is listed or is posted on the World Bank website. So we have to wait a little bit for the post of this, um, this World Bank report from the SIPA team where there are three, four other graduate students also, PhD students were involved. And this was a project on fiscal policy for a low carbon economy. So uh, I would like to have uh, William uh, uh, Will Milberg, our Dean of the uh, New School for Social Research, the graduate faculty, to uh, make some welcome remarks. So Will, can you start? Yeah, thank you, Billy. I just wanna welcome everybody to the New School, as it were, and the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis. I wanna congratulate Billy and the SIPA team for, the, hosting this event, but also for just persisting with the research project and the research agenda of climate change as we emerged from you know, a, a period of time in, in which uh, climate issues were really uh, considered secondary, if, if even real. So uh, we're now in a moment when of course, uh, the US is recovering. And I mean that in the broadest sense of the word, not just in the macroeconomic sense, not just in the epidemiological sense, but also in the political sense from the isolationism of the previous administration. And as the US recovers, it doesn't just pick up where it left off. And uh, that in some ways was the expectation uh, as the new administration uh, was, was elected and came to power, but there has really been a shift. And this shift uh, is one which, in which uh, economic stimulus seems to be playing a different role than it was expected to play previously. And it's one with therefore a kind of new role for the state. And President Biden took the George Washington portrait down behind him and put up the FDR portrait behind him. Uh, climate and climate change is now central to debates around not just climate policy, but foreign policy and economic policy and industrial policy and social welfare policy generally. So it's a new moment. It's not just a kind of picking up where we left off. And very interestingly, it's a macroeconomic moment. It's about income and demand and not about prices. And yes, we do see a, a, a kind of new debate around the role of fiscal policy and, and, and deficits and their sustainability, but we also see a, diff, a shift in the view of what businesses respond to in terms of taxes, what drives corporate investment. And now the debate over corporate taxes and their relation to investment is different than it was before. And I suspect, and it appears that the relation, the discussion around the relation between carbon prices and uh, sustainable energy, renewable energy is also shifting. 
from a price to a more income and demand driven discussion. And, you know, as an old Keynesian, I'm very comfortable and interested by this moment. But more importantly, this panel is the perfect panel to be having at this time. And I want to just congratulate Vili for bringing together this panel at a kind of turning point in our thinking, certainly in the US, and I'm curious to hear more about the European situation around climate policy and around the role that macroeconomic policy can, can play in that. So congratulations to Vili, and I turn it back to you to introduce this exciting panel. Thank you very much, Vili. It was an excellent introduction. Already took a lot uh, uh, of that what I wanted to say. So wonderful, I can be short. So uh, the idea was indeed, um, so after the pandemic meltdown, so to speak, there's now the recovery discussed, recovery phase discussed. And um, academics and policymakers, and particularly also the well-known policy institutions like IMF and World Bank and ILO and others, uh, they are arguing that that has to be now combined with the recovery program, with the green recovery program. So uh, this is now uh, brought in into the policy discussion a lot, as Bill already uh, mentioned. And the governments have set new, also in the last, uh, well, actually the last few months, new goals to uh, get uh, carbon, net carbon um, uh, emission down to 50% 2030, then uh, 2050 zero net emission, almost across the world. All, all governments are announcing this yet. This already uh, to get closer to the 1.5% degree Celsius, whether or not that will be achieved, it's a very big uh, uh, question and issue. Uh, in particular, there are big, uh, there are two things big uh, uh, stimulus uh, packages. And so, uh, to a great extent, as Will already said, uh, Keynesian, this is a second stimulus package, the uh, uh, Biden um, uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, program. And the first one was basically a rescue program for the, uh, the, uh, from the um, epidemic uh, epidemic disease, and uh, uh, the uh, what the fraction is so to speak that goes to uh, climate policy is a little bit different in the U.S. and in Europe. So uh, Francesco will probably talk about this a little bit later. On the other hand, also the monetary policy has is stepping in again. And uh, this monetary policy is, uh, well, particular in Europe, pretty active. And uh, Lagarde has announced many times that she is pushing the policy, uh, uh, the climate policy forward. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, mobilization of the financial markets that you have uh, probably observed, where whether or not the well financial market can be helpful to push uh, uh, climate finance and uh, sustainable finance. Um, we have now uh, participants from major um, uh, policy institutions here. Uh, let me uh, introduce them uh, quickly before uh, we go in the sequence uh, through all four speakers. So first we have uh, Dirk Heine, who is uh, a senior economist at the World Bank. He uh, is the connecting person, so to speak, from the World Bank to the well, many countries' finance ministries and integrating uh, climate um, consideration in fiscal policy. He has written uh, five, six um, World Bank publications on uh, um, climate policy and fiscal policy. And he was also in earlier times um, uh, uh, working for the German Ministry of Finance. So uh, Dirk will be the first speaker. He mainly will speak about um, carbon uh, pricing and or um, uh, carbon tax, uh, maybe in combination with other tools. So the second speaker will be Nicoletta um, Battini. She is uh, the uh, well, lead um, evaluator at the Independent Evaluation Office in, uh, uh, at the IMF. Uh, they play a very important role, a critical role, so to speak, in IMF policy. They're reconsidering what the IMF policy was and should be as, so to speak, a, some kind of external or internal external evaluator. She was in the policy committee uh, of uh, the Bank of England. Uh, she was professor in the um, UK. She is uh, 
uh, was director of the International Economics and Policy Office of the Italian Treasury. So uh, theoretically and practically very uh, experienced. And she will speak about does the, uh, the expenditure program that is planned now uh, with a big uh, climate policy component, does it have a bigger multiplier effect? Does it, is it more effective than the usual Keynesian um, uh, expenditure programs or the um, fiscal, exp <coughs> fiscal uh, stimulus programs? So uh, that's a very important question. And Paul is um, uh, the John Paulson Chair of European Political Economy at the London School of Economics. Uh, he is uh, doing a lot of research on the European integration, European policy. Uh, he wrote books about um, monetary macroeconomics, in particular, and also uh, books and articles on open economy and exchange rates. And he is something, somebody who, uh, well, is basically one of the leaders in behavioral economics. So I'm very happy to have uh, Paul uh, here on board. And uh, he was also the first one who did uh, uh, well, um, first voices, uh, critical voices on the European austerity politics. And he termed this uh, as, uh, well, a panic-driven austerity. And I tell this sometimes to my students, and everybody understands then what has happened in Europe after 2008, nine. So, and uh, Francesco is the deputy director of, of the OFCE, which is some kind of uh, macroeconomic, or one of the leading macroeconomic institutes in France. And uh, he is also teaching at the same time in Paris and in, uh, in Rome. He has uh, recently had a book on macroeconomics, was endorsed by um, uh, Blanc Olivier Blanchard. He works on inequality and macroeconomic performance and macroeconomic policy. And particular uh, with the view, well, did the structural reforms in uh, Europe, uh, did it any good or was it not so good, the structural macroeconomic reforms? So uh, he's speaking then mainly about fiscal policy and um, uh, infrastructure and climate related infrastructure. So Paul more mainly on monetary policy of Europe. And then the first two speakers about the uh, US. Uh, and worldwide uh, climate policy. So let's start with uh, Dirk now. Yeah, Dirk, can we start? And uh, we have uh, want to have the presentations first, and then yeah. Q and A Q and A questions after this, so you um, can uh, send some messages and Q and A questions. Great, thank you. I am receiving an error message that I don't have. Uh, rights to share my screen. Um, so maybe we can yes. skip the next presentation and then I can go afterwards. I didn't follow your last sentence. What do you, you want to have some? He wants to switch the order. Switch your order? Oh, I see. Well, okay. Um, Nicoletta, do you want to go first? No, the problem was just removed. Some the problem was that I have I didn't have the authority to share my screen, but now I I have. Um, oh, you so have it. Okay, good. Then let's. Uh, it, it was just given to me. All right, so all I, with these little uh, um, technical I problems. Know. I can hopefully now you can see my screen. Yes. So the currently there's a very big impetus of green stimulus, and so that is very important. And I don't want to contradict at all that the need for green expenditure policies, green investment policies at all. So the starting point, I believe, is that we all agree on the need for currently to use green investment policies. The point of this presentation is to look ahead and to make sure that at some point, countries are going to need to rebuild fiscal space again. What do we do then? How do we ensure that the fiscal, that the green recovery continues? Um, the situation on debt is particularly consider uh, an important one for developing countries. So we currently have this big uptick in debt. And so it is important for us to continue speaking about green investments. But at the same time, we do need to consider that uh, at some point, uh, finance, the countries will have to rebuild their public finances. And then there is a risk if we don't address this early on, that it might be said that climate policy, if we just push climate policy through the expenditure route, 
that it could be said, now we cannot afford climate policy anymore. Now, it's very important that we continue to do climate policy. So we need to be thinking ahead uh, and so that we don't have what we had in the past a, a lot that climate policy it was said that we cannot afford climate action. When we think besides that, we also need to consider the broader context for the private sector. There's a problem of price incentives. And that problem is that not only uh, since the since COVID hit, another, another big change has been about fuel prices. So here's a, a forecast from last month about um, um, uh, one and a half month ago from about uh, fuel prices well into the future. And we see that a uh, few prices have been decreasing and are consistently lower now than um, they have been in terms of long-term averages. And that is problematic when we consider incentives to go green. Uh, the in incentives, uh, the price incentives are important. And, uh, and so the private sector is not receiving currently the right incentives to be investing into the long run green. So currently stimulus packages make it interesting to participate, but in order for the private sector now want to jump on these public programs and contribute also for the fiscal multipliers currently to be good so that by the uh, private sector chipping in, uh, it's a problem that the future price uh, are like as they are. At the same time, green technology costs are also coming down. So it's not exactly clear what actually the future outlook is. It's a bit contradictory. Um, when we then think about, okay, so what can we do? So uh, the, 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 we are in a situation where I said the fuel prices are very low and then we, we need to also rebuild fiscal space. And at the same time, we have, a, we have continued issue problems about output and about employment. How would we be raising taxes again? And here we would like to raise the emphasis on environmental taxes for all of these reasons. Environmental taxation of fuel can improve the future outlook for the price incentives compared to what you just saw, the pre-tax prices that are falling. Uh, they can uh, also be rebuilding fiscal space because they have a have good revenue potential. We estimate that um, in, implementing carbon taxation in line with the Paris Agreement would raise about 1% to 3% of GDP in countries and revenues. And then uh, they are doing better than some other taxes for output. And this is here as a, as a study by, uh, by a former uh, New School graduate, Christian Schroeder, um, con comparing personal income taxes and environmental taxes and uh, showing that labor taxes in situations where pre-tax fuel prices are low, so that is the regime we are in and that we will be in for a while, uh, environmental taxes have better output multipliers. So there's an opportunity then to be combining green objectives, labor market objectives, and, uh, uh, and revenue objectives in an output friendly way to make sure that we can continue the green recovery um, after uh, countries are worried again about their public finances. Saving revenue is also good from a here another participant, uh, another co-author that we have been working with at the World Bank from the New School, um, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, who has been giving us a lot of advice. Uh, when we think about the green and entrepreneurial state, we want to be focusing the role of, pub, of investments, of an expenditure policy on strategic investments, strategic investments to be building the new green markets. Uh, yet countries are actually also using expenditure policy for lots of things where maybe expenditure policy is not the most effective instrument, maybe where they could be using tax policy. And because they can only spend the same dollar once, um, it would be better if, they, if we would be able to focus in particular on building these new green markets, bringing technology costs down, et cetera. So having a more strategic focus of the, of the expenditure side. Tax policy is reacting to this. We can see that countries are increasingly adopting carbon taxes or emissions trading systems. However, there is a huge tax gap. If you look at what the IMF is, for example, suggesting in the papers by David Cody and Ian Perry, we have something like a 6% of worldwide GDP of a tax gap on fossil fuels. So we have a very significant way to go in terms of uh, for fiscal policy to act on fuels. 
Uh, have countries done this or is this just a, a completely crazy idea? Yes, we have seen in the past countries going out of a recession and doing environmental tax reform. Sweden is a famous example. In 1991, it had the largest uh, macro crisis since the Second World War for Sweden and it went out by cutting the taxes that it, ha uh, that it failed. We are holding back shared prosperity and shifting tax burden to carbon. Similarly, Germany in 2001, much the same reform, also quite good impact about, uh, uh, about a double dividend. Similarly, Turkey in 2001, going out of a macro crisis and, and adopting the largest environmental taxation of the transport sector of all OECD countries with quite good impacts for not just rebuilding fiscal space, but also greening the economy. Or the flagship example is British Columbia, because probably the best managed and the best studied of these reforms and indicating that these reforms helped reduce emissions, improve equity, improve employment and improve output. So they, by designing the reform in the most, they, that was the most textbook example of designing the reforms, very clean way of designing the reform and very good outcomes. Um, and now we have similarly some countries that are pursuing a similar strategy, Germany, just again, uh, uh, Kenya, Sudan, Nigeria, North Macedonia, countries that currently are pursuing uh, sort of green fiscal reforms in a similar vein. So I will stop here and, and make my synthesis is that we should be continuing green stimulus. Uh, we should also be thinking about the next phase. We should not be waiting for countries and afterwards to say we cannot afford climate policy anymore or public finances are too bad. We should be preempting that and saying no, equally when you have worry about your public finances, you can still continue a green recovery. And in fact, countries should be signaling their future action already now because the private sector is currently facing very contradictory and potentially negative future outlooks on, um, uh, on green investments. And it's important also for the effectiveness of current stimulus policies that the, uh, that the uh, public sector is signaling that in the future incentives for green investments are good so that the private sector currently will want to join public investment programs and that we increase the fiscal multiplier through crowding in the private sector into current green investment programs. I finish with a big thanks to the new school. We have had 11 uh, staff or uh, graduates from the new school involved in the World Bank program on climate macroeconomics. We continue to be working, wanting to work very closely with the new school. We appreciate that a lot. And we are also very interested to other participants who might be hearing this. Uh, for reaching out because um, uh, we are very interested in doing work and collaboration together with you. Thank you. Uh, in particular you. here to Aaron Haidt, who I know is on the call and who just published a book on how these fiscal policies uh, relate to uh, land use emissions uh, and who is a great example of uh, following new graduation from the new school, turning the work that she did in the new school, her thesis in the new school into a change in finance ministries in developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you very much. This is an excellent presentation of the issue of carbon tax now. Probably the issue will come up a little bit later to what extent this is appropriate to do it in the, to impose this in the recession. But um, also thank you for your uh, well compliments that the new school students are so good and have a window of opportunity at the World Bank. So that's really very good, great news. Um, and there is some very good cooperation, I think, in the very also a joint spirit, so to speak, how to improve things uh, with new school and the uh, people who are there at the World Bank. So, but the next speaker will be um, Nicoletta. Uh, Battini, I have introduced her before already. Uh, one of the issues is, of course, now what is the, uh, if you have this green spending and uh, uh, what is the actual effect on this compared to earlier studies on uh, um, stimulus packages? So 78, 79 was a big one and every recession creates a, a big uh, stimulus package. There's one in the uh, US and one in Europe. And she did very interesting work on the question, well, does the green spending now have a bigger uh, multiplier effect than other types of spending? So, Nicoletta, can you step in? Ah, yeah, there, there. All right. Uh, 
Are you muted? No, it's okay. Sorry, I had a little, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let me try again. Uh, this should be uh, share. Okay. Thank you, Willy, and thank you for having me in this uh, very distinguished panel. Um, I know I don't have much time, but I, I think it's worth uh, maybe looking at some of these results, which I'll present um, you know, with my research hat on, I'm not talking from the IEO perspective or, you know, not, not really representing the IMF here, but of course I work at the IMF and I work at the IEO and we, you know, we can have a conversation. Uh, these results are, um, I think important for the Build Back Better uh, debate because they do something uh, which uh, was, I think, missing from, you know, um, the debate, which is that of, basically focus on ways uh, that the green recovery can uh, help um, GDP grow. And uh, just to uh, clarify, this is joint work with uh, Mario Di Serio and Matteo Fragetta from the University of Salerno, Giovanni Melina, who's in research the IMF, and uh, Anthony Waldron, who's currently the lead author of the 30 by 30 economic analysis project which brings together over a hundred uh, researchers across 10 disciplines to examine the, the economic impacts of the proposed convention of biological diversity target to protect a third of the planet for nature. So it's, it's really, uh, a, I think, a very strong team. Um, and, and the motivation uh, for this work is to basically, um, as I said, look at the impact of investing in green technologies for economies, which you know is what um, these transitions are also about. It's not just about making the planet sustainable, but also bring it to an equilibrium, which you know is of sheer prosperity of, of growth and and um, uh, you know development in many countries. And um, what we do is not really a cost-benefit analysis at the sector level. It's really a traditional Keynes 1936 multiplier analysis. So we basically import, you know, the, the methodologies used for fiscal multipliers, and we apply them to investment in green technologies. Uh, I just want to make clear one more thing, which is that when we when I say green technologies and uh, green land uses, um, we use the IPCC definitions for zero low carbon, and we call non-eco-friendly what the IPCC also defines high carbon. So, you know, of course there are variations across technologies, uh, but that's what, what we use. Uh, the, um, uh, let me start with a, a little bit of motivation. Just can a green recovery be a strong recovery? This is a question that's been in the back of the mind of a lot of people. And we know that um, some countries have, uh, you know, thought that there was a trade-off between a doing a recovery that is green and doing, uh, you know, a, a sustainable and from an economic point of view recovery. And what we know is that, um, you know, 2020, uh, because of COVID, so cuts uh, in emissions globally, uh, but also more sensitivity uh, alongside the crisis on climate biodiversity. Uh, at the same time, however, the, the agenda, because of you know the fact that governments were very engaged in uh, dealing with the health emergency and the economic distress, was in part derailed. Um, a lot of the stimuli on the fiscal front did not go to uh, making economies greener. They actually, a lot of them locked in uh, if you wish, banner technologies. Uh, so a lot of people have called for, you know, shifts in this direction of policy to ensure that, you know, the recovery is green. Um, and so this question, I think, of whether the trade there's a trade-off between investing in green and having strong recovery is is very pertinent. And and these analysis should be at hand. And there's a big gulf uh, between uh, you know, where we should be um, and where we are. So uh, on latest estimates, 
uh, published in Nature in January, um, COVID-19 took a, a bite out of global carbon emissions, uh, but trends varied and world emissions when we take account 52 weeks, 2020, that actually dropped 64 out of 2019. And um, we need, according to the IPCC, that uh, emissions fall by 7.6 per year, uh, not 6.4. And, uh, and crucially, uh, we do know that 6.4 uh, occurred because many parts of the world just came to standstill. So um, we need to really do structural adjustment the way economies work. And uh, what we do know, according to latest uh, data on um, technology and their uh, you know, deployment, that we need double the clean energy investment, uh, what was pledged to stay within 2.5. And we also need about seven to 10 times more spending on conservation to reach the 30% uh, conservation of the planet as here, you know, Paris. So we're very far from where we should go. We need a lot of investment and spending. And I, you know, of course, uh, agree with Dirk that, you know, these can pose potential risks to, uh, you know, fiscal dynamics. And I'll get to that a little later. Um, I want to just uh, spend a couple of words on um, the fact that, uh, you know, it took quite a while to assemble the this data set. This is a very unique data set that we use. We look at a variety of green expenditure typologies. We look at both energy and land use to cover the bulk of emissions. And within green spending, we look at clean energy that includes solar, wind, on and offshore, hydro, geothermal, biomass, and nuclear. And we also look at ecosystem conservation. Um, no necro friendly spending, we look at fossil fuels and subsidies to industrial crop and animal agriculture. Um, I don't want to spend much time on this. The, the paper has, um, you know, a good thirty percent is on the data that we used, and it uh, took me about six months to put the data set together. And working with, uh, you know, a, a variety of uh, international organizations and uh, conservation think tanks and other stakeholders. But just let me say that um, there's a lot of data available on emissions and climate change. But data on investment capital expenditure uh, on non-eco-friendly energy or friendly eco-friendly energy is is very hard to get by. A lot of this has to be purchased, and often it's non-comparable. Uh, same thing with data on conservation, uh, which uh, you know there's no standardized definition of what constitutes but biodiversity spending, and therefore we use Anthony's uh, and Dan Miller. Um, strict spending definition for uh, biodiversity, which is based on four sources, domestic governments, international aid, long-term endowment-based systems, such as conservation trust funds, and self financing uh, arrangements. Uh, for non-eco-friendly spending on land use, we use uh, some cleaned uh, categories of the OECD um, producer support estimates that were produced by Insertinger at WRI and the World Bank. Um, and so there was a tremendous amount of work and the data set is truly unique. So this is the first time that a multiplier estimate of this kind has been attempted. I'm not gonna spend much time uh, on uh, the methodology. Just uh, let me say, however, that um, we use panel VRs and the reduced form um, is represented at the top of this slide. The vector of endogenous variables is uh, explained by country fixed effects rho, time fixed effects gamma, and osteographic components of y and exogenous variable, um, the narrow term. And we use we use patient approach to estimate um, this these VRs, uh, and we identify the shocks using a standard Cholesky decomposition. We we have got question at the seminar when we first presented on this. Um, and I can, can answer this question, but I think we shouldn't take time from showing the results real quick, which is, I think, the interest of this uh, particular event today. Just a quick look at the country coverage. We have a quite substantial country coverage in years. Um, this is not a choice. This is what exists. Uh, and this is, um, uh, you know, a constrained choice, but uh, it's actually uh, not that bad. And it, it represents both 
advanced economies, emerging market economies, and lower income countries, um, depending on what sector, what technology we look at, you could get you know, a glimpse of, of different countries and different uh, years. Um, I would like to go to the results and uh, basically um, report uh, what we found. So uh, first of all, multiplier values, which are shown here in the table, uh, in the blue table, uh, should be interpreted in the standard way. For example, value of the cumulated spending multiplier equal to 1.5 in the third year uh, would indicate that after three years from the current of the spending shock, the cumulative increase in output in dollar terms is one and a half the size of the cumulative increase in green expenditure. So it's a standard interpretation. Um, I, I would like to focus mostly on these results. I mean, of course, there are differences in persistence of the green shock, if you wish, relative to the non-eco-friendly shock. The green shock always tends to be more persistent. Um, and so that's good news for the economy, of course. And also it tends to be larger always and with higher probability than the non-eco-friendly investment. Uh, in the case of energy, it's almost double uh, or double. And uh, we actually did run a test to check if it was uh, it actually we could you know, prove statistically that this difference uh, exists and the probability that you know these multipliers in the second column are double or more than the third column is over 90% in all, in all the cases. So I think this is a very, a very strong result. We, we found similar uh, and even larger results for nuclear energy. This is a form of green energy, but it's not renewable because uranium cannot be renewed on a human time scale. Uh, but the multipliers are extremely large in the first years when you know the reactors are being constructed. Um, we also found uh, when we moved to green land use that um, multipliers, uh, and these are not directly comparable, but it gives you a sense of how much if you spend a dollar in conservation, how much you're going to get out of it, you know, over two, three, four, or five years, they're extremely large. And uh, whereas if you spend for industrial agriculture, which is as we know, uh, highly polluting, uh, you know, you get less than a dollar for a dollar in spending. So um, we also looked at bottom up analysis because we wonder whether these multiplier effects, you know, were actually met in sexual studies. And there's almost a complete alignment with what people find when they look at individual sexual uh, cost benefit analysis. And this is discussed in the paper. So I would like just to quickly wrap up because my time is over. Uh, and just to say that, um, you know, it is now a, a unique opportunity to build back better. Um, and I think we all agree on that. And there's a lot of spending going on. Uh, we found here using a methodology, which, which is standard, um, that there, there is actually evidence spending on, on, on green um, technologies uh, and produce more growth. And it also, going back to what Dirk is saying, is economically sustainable because it ends up producing more GDP than it initially requires. That means for debt purposes, you know, that it's fiscally sustainable. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, we do thus conclude that, you know, there shouldn't be a, a view that there is a trade-off between a green recovery and a strong recovery, but on the contrary, a recovery can only be strong if it's green. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting research, I must say. Many people say that the multiplier of green investment are bigger than um, for other investments or just uh, expenditure, but nobody had really shown this in data. And so this is a very fantastic new result that will push probably also policymakers to be more confident in the green investment. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. I will postpone some questions also later too, after everybody has um, spoken there. Uh, Paul is now um, next. Yeah, Paul, are you there? Paul de Graaf, or is that he is? Uh, oh, yeah, Paul is there. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm here. Monetary policy. Yeah. Okay, monetary. I'm going to. 
So we get back. I'm going to share the screen. Yes, but not your uh, slides. Do you see it now? Yes. Just a second. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, really, for inviting me. I'm very pleased uh, to be with you today and to discuss issues that relate to um, the environment and, and, and such an important issue today that, that uh, it's, it's good that we can talk about this and, and look at the problem from many different perspectives. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, how a central bank can actually um, promote green investments. And let me, by way of introduction, then start by asking the question um, whether the central bank can actually use money creation to finance investments in the environment. And, and just to remind you, the ECB, but also other central banks have issued uh, a lot of money the, the last few years. Um, the ECB has created altogether like 3.5 trillion euros uh, of um, money, money base. Um, and most of that money creation has gone to financial institutions that up to now have done relatively little with it. And then the question then is, why can't a central bank inject the money into environmental investments instead of pouring it into the financial sector? Um, in my talk, I will focus on the ECB, but basically, the ideas that I uh, develop can also be applied to other central banks. Right? So in order to, to, to do that, let me first remind you of the basics of money, right? The modern money creation is based on the fact that the central bank um, buys assets in the markets, right? Um, and the supply of these assets typically are financial institutions and they then obtain as a counterpart of their sales of financial assets, a deposit at the central bank. Um, and this is called the, the money base, right? Which can then be used um, as a base to create uh, credit and, and expanding the economy. Um, by the way, this is also the moment the central bank actually organizes a de facto debt relief, huh? because when the central bank buys government bonds um, and keeps it on its balance sheet, it organized a circular, circular flow of interest, right? The, the government pays interest to the central bank, but since the central bank um, transfer all its profits back to the government, so at the end of the year, the, the interest that has been paid by the treasury will return to the treasury. So de facto, um, this is a, a kind of debt relief, right? Uh, in, you know, from an economic point of view, this, it's as if these bonds don't exist any longer. But that's an aside. Um, so note also there is no restriction on how much a central bank can buy, right? It can actually buy the, the whole stuff, the, all assets possibly can be bought. Um, I'm not saying it should do that. And in fact, typically central banks will constrain themselves by promising to maintain price stability, i.e. typically um, not allowing inflation to exceed 2%, right? So that's the constraint that exists on, on central banks, a constraint that they have imposed on themselves. But remember, they can potentially do much more, right? There is also no restriction on what central banks can buy, right? Typically they buy, um, government bonds in the context of open market operations or QE operations. Um, they can also buy corporate bonds or other bonds issued by uh, the EIB, European Investment Bank, for example. Um, and, and therefore, um, the ECB can actually also purchase bonds issued to finance uh, environmental investments. Again, the restriction is this should not be inflationary, right? So. Um, what are the options then for the ECB? Because the constraint should be, should not be inflationary, um, <clears throat> but the central bank can actually buy any financial asset um, within that constraint. As I told you earlier, the, the ECB has bought approximately 3.5 trillion, um, trillion of government bonds and other assets, uh, and they have not fueled inflation up to now. 
Now, the ECB has announced that when these government bonds come to maturity, it will buy new government bonds um, in the same amount so as to keep the money stock, the money base unchanged, right? That's what it has announced, that a commitment it has made. We don't know how long it will keep that commitment. I will say a few things about this later. But now all this creates a window of opportunities, right? For the central bank, because at the moment, these bonds come to maturity, instead of buying new government bonds, actually the ECB could buy environmental bonds, right? bonds that have been issued to finance environmental investments. And if the ECB were to do that, it would not create new money, it would just reorient money flows towards environmental projects um, while keeping the total amount of money unchanged and therefore not by doing this, not risking additional inflation. So that's the key, that's the key insight, right? Um, so the, the, the ECB can actually do it by changing the composition of its portfolio of bonds, less government bonds, more green bonds. Um, and in doing so, it would keep the money base unchanged, but would reorient financial resources towards green investments. Now, what are the objections to that? Let me um, just mention two of them. Um, one objection would be that, well, um, if the ECB were to do that buying environmental bonds, it would have to make decisions like how much public and private investments, or green investments to promote should it be renewable energy or maybe nuclear energy? Should the ECB give priority to, for example, public transportation? And these are questions that have to be settled by political authorities, not by a central bank um, that has no legitimacy to do that, right? So how can we uh, solve this problem? And, and here the idea is to put some institutions in between. And, one possibility is to take the European Investment Bank, but could also be other um, financial institutions, public institutions that has that you give the authority, politicians give the authority to the EIB to um, promote uh, environmental investments and, for example, to, uh, to, to have a, a program of one trillion of environmental investments. Um, the political authorities would also decide about where that should be, what the priorities are, and then the EIB would issue the bonds uh, necessary to finance all these investments. And the, the, the micro decision about where this would go would be in the context of the EIB that actually gets a kind of contract from political authorities to do so. And all the ECB that has to do is to buy these EIB bonds, right? So it would not be involved itself in a decision about what exactly, um, what kind of investments to do. That would not be what the central banker should do. And, and, and so again, that would be a way to, to, to deal with the problem. Second objection is that um, when the ECB <laughs> buys these green EIB bonds to replace maturing government bonds, that will force national governments to issue new bonds to roll over the old ones. Huh? Remember, um, the, the ECB would do that when government bonds, bonds come to maturity. It will not buy new government bonds, but green bonds. Therefore, these governments will have to roll over the old debt by issuing new debt, new bonds, government bonds. And, and so what you can see that is this proposal actually is equivalent to an investment program financed by national governments that issue new government bonds. And actually that's the right way to do it, right? Um, it would be a program where national government issue bonds to finance investments. So you may ask, why not do it directly? Well, here it is. In Europe, as you know, we have all these dogmas, right? About what governments can do. And one of the dogmas is, following from the fiscal compact that says that um, the budget should be in equilibrium over the business cycle. Therefore, governments cannot issue uh, debt over the business cycle. They cannot finance investment by issuing debt. So that's today a, a kind of self-imposed 
I would say, stupid fiscal rule that prevents the, um, the governments to do what should be done. And here, by doing it for the ECB, it's a kind of way to circumvent this ridiculous rule. How long can the ECB pursue this strategy of creating green money? Well, that will depend on the question of how long it keeps all these bonds, these 3.5 trillion bonds on its balance sheet. Now, suppose in the future we have more inflation, it's not to be um, excluded. Um, in, in that case, the ECB may be forced to sell part of these bonds, right? I'm saying part because it's very unlikely we'll have to sell the whole thing, but it could be forced to do so. And, and that, of course, would reduce its capacity to, to create this kind of green money. But I take it that um, there are also other instruments the ECB could use, like raising the interest rate, um, and, and that it would be able to maintain a significant amount of green bonds on, on its balance sheet. Let me conclude. Given the existential nature of the degradation of the environment and um, the, the, the climate problems, priority should be given to um, the central bank's money creating capacity, provided this can be done without creating inflation. And I think, I, I hope I've convinced you that this can be done by modern central banks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. This is a very interesting, I think, uh, important aspect of uh, climate finance uh, through the central banks. And it's in Europe more uh, developed already than the US. The Fed would not be so openly speaking about this, as you know, whereas the central bank in Europe, the ECB did. Um, and uh, there may be some uh, questions coming later. We answer this in Q&A format then later, Paul. But now let's move first to uh, uh, Francesco. And uh, Francesco, are you ready? Francesco will speak about the European Infrastructure Programme and the, uh, what part of this will be the uh, Green Infrastructure Programme. Francesco, are they there? I am. I'm sharing my screen with you. Good. Okay, uh, well, first of all, I joined the other panelists in thanking you really for organizing this very interesting uh, discussion. I was asked to, to try to give you an European perspective and also to give you some, uh, let's say some information because as you know, e Europe is a very strange animal with lots of rules of its own. And so it's not very clear from the outside what we are actually uh, doing. So what I will try to do, I will try to quickly go over the, uh, European recovery uh, fund uh, functioning and, and, and to see what the uh, European governments are, are trying to do with that money, especially concerning, of course, the, the uh, green transition. What is interesting is that, of course, we, we saw from Nicoletta and from Paul that, A, uh, these green investments, if it happens the way it's supposed to happen, it will have a significant impact on growth. And second, we are, we've seen from Paul that if the ECB tries to reorient and to reconvert its own uh, uh, bond purchase program, uh, there will not be any problem of financing uh, that investment and further national investment that comes over. So uh, very, uh, very quickly, so that we leave time for the, uh, the Q&A session that I expect to be uh, rich and interesting. First, let me start with a uh, with the uh, with a sort of assessment. Europe has been uh, uh, lagging behind in public investment. The uh, the the, uh, the decline in public investment is dates back to uh, to the 80s. It has accelerated, starting from the uh, from the global financial crisis. I had the honor and the pleasure to to coordinate some work of a group of researchers on a on a public investment outlook uh, uh, that came out last June. And the, uh, our colleagues from different countries and different institutions all uh, converged on the, uh, on the uh, assessment of a serious lack of uh, uh, public capital in, in European countries. And this holds also for countries that pride themselves with having very healthy uh, public finances. The uh, German colleagues, for example, in their chapter, they showed that the, the, they assessed the deficit, the infrastructure deficit of Germany to be 
around 450 billions over the next decade. So it's a huge amount of money that is uh, needed, even in healthy uh, countries like uh, Germany. So that was the first point I wanted to make. Second point I wanted to make is that, of course, public investment has been dropping drastically, not alone. This is a, a table that was uh, provided by a colleague from the EIB who also contributed to the outlook, but it, it dropped together with the, with the <coughs> with private investment. So the, the uh, uh, boosting uh, uh, public investment seems to be one of the main tools we have to also restart public investment as the recovery is uh, uh, starting to go uh, to, to be on its way. And so let me go to, 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 the, um, to what, we, what Europe chose to, to actually try to, to restart public investment. We chose a very, very peculiar tool. Remember, Europe is not a federal state. It's a, it's, it's a sum of national government and national, and national governments have kept the hand on, on their own fiscal policies. So the way Europe found to, to try to finance the uh, in public investment for the recovery has been to create this instrument, the next generation EU, which is basically a, 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 a facility that we lend, we borrow, sorry, on markets, quite a substantial amount of money. We're talking about 750 billions of, of euros. And that money will then be distributed to country either in the form of loans or in, forms, in the form of grants. And then the payment of this commission, that it's the first time the commission takes up such a large amount of debt, they did it for a much smaller program in the past, that amount of debt will be paid over a 30 year period starting in 2028. The other thing that not many people know outside Europe is that that, that uh, borrowing uh, plan was actually um, uh, embedded into the wider negotiation on the uh, multi-annual uh, multi financial framework of the European Union, basically the budget. So what is available in the next few years is not just 750 billion, it's also the, uh, it's also the uh, trillion do uh, euros uh, of the European budget. Uh, just a notice on comp of comparison, uh, non-Europeans might not know it, but in Europe we have been uh, stricken by the uh, quickness and the uh, size of the uh, plans that Joe Biden has announced in the past few weeks. And so many people have been saying that the Re European Recovery Fund was insufficient, and uh, especially compared to the United States. Let's be uh, careful, nevertheless, in comparing the, uh, the fiscal effort of European countries with the United States, because it is true that the United States have been putting in place, are putting in place a massive effort, but the, for example, the infrastructure plan of the United States is supposed to be spent over the next 10 years, while the next generation EU program, the disbursement of the funds will, go, will run only for five years between 2021 and 2026. I'm not saying that we are doing as much as the United States, but the comparison is not so un as unfavorable, unfavorable, sorry, as some people actually uh, think. So the uh, priorities of these investment programs, so that I go towards the uh, discussion of what is interesting for us, the three priorities of this uh, next generation EU program are the priorities that the commission had set for itself, for its work program, even before the COVID crisis. So first of all, the ecological transition, then the digitalization of the economy, and last but not least, the uh, cohesion, or in particular, the territorial, the regional cohesion of the uh, EU. And the, uh, the emphasis is on actually climate action. The requirement is that governments that prepare their plans that, uh, that will be financed by the commission I'll, um, give at least 30, at least 37 percent of that in a green uh, in a green investment in the first pillar of the of the uh, plan on top of that the commission has added also a, a transition fund basically to try to uh, finance the conversion of uh, carbon uh, uh, of carbon intensive sectors that is endowed with uh, not to, I mean, a symbolic amount of 10 billion uh, euros. <clears throat> okay, the European uh, countries have been preparing their plans, their plans to be submitted to the Commission the past few weeks. The deadline was last week, last, uh, uh, last uh, Friday, April 30, and our colleagues from, two colleagues from the, uh, from, uh, <clears throat> 
from Bruegel have been doing a, a incredibly useful work in comparing the uh, uh, recovery and resilience plans of the four largest uh, European economies. <clears throat> Remember that the allocation of these funds is not is actually um, based on the needs of the different countries. Uh, and basically, this need is uh, assessed uh, through the impact of the crisis. This means that this plan is also introducing some sort of risk sharing across European countries. So, so the countries that are better off are now financing investment and in general the expenditure for the recovery in the countries that are uh, that does not are not doing uh, as well as the others. Second is that when we compare the plans of these four countries, we should remember that the only country that decided to to use both the loans and the grants is Italy, and the maybe Spain will do it in the future. For the moment, they're not doing it. France and Germany only decided to draw their plan to 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 submit their plans for the uh, utilization of grants, and this explains why, as you can see. In, the, in these uh, <clears throat> highlighted here, the Italian, the size of the Italian program is way larger than the uh, German and France one, and it's also larger of the Spanish one because it, it's the only one that includes both uh, grants and uh, loans. And as you can see, the the all the countries respect the broad allocation in green digital and the others where you have also cohesion all, in all countries we have at least 30 percent 37 percent of uh, uh, of uh, 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 of green and uh, 20 percent of uh, digital um, <clears throat> so what these countries do well uh, 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 in terms of infrastructure uh, germany only put all of its effort on electric mobility so basically cars uh, uh, cars, buses, and rail, and also the uh, charging stations that go uh, together with that. Uh, in Italy and in France, there was a massive uh, attention to uh, uh, railway system. There was a choice by, made by Italy that was pretty much criticized here in, in Italy because the focus was on high-speed trains to try to link the north and the south of Italy. And lots of uh, green uh, movements argue that more emphasis on local transportation would have been uh, much more environmentally friendly. And this shows the difficulty of actually preparing these plants where these trade-offs appeared all, the, all over the uh, place. Uh, coming to investment in green energy, uh, the, most countries actually had strong emphasis on hydrogen, blue or green, it depends. And this was actually also a source of polemical arguments in most uh, in most uh, countries. Uh, Spain and Italy also had some of their investment projects in other, in, other, uh, in other fields like renewable energy, smart grids, and so on and so forth. One explanation why, remember, this is where size matters in some sense, one explanation why there are so many differences and there is much more diversification in, uh, in, the, in Spain and in Italy, it's because these countries spend much more uh, uh, resources so the limited relatively limited resources that france and germany had were all put in the same basket and uh, that was a difference with the other countries and this is just uh, a, a representation as you can see it's also taken by the from these uh, brugel uh, text that was that was really making a great job in comparing the plants and as you can see the <clears throat> Uh, the items are uh, quite the same uh, all in all countries, but they have different uh, proportions. <clears throat> the uh, interest of the next generation, but also the limitation of the next generation, is as I told, it's a, it's, it's a huge land and borrow, uh, borrow and land uh, scheme. And so, in fact, it, uh, the, uh, the, it remains central in this, in this uh, scheme. The, um, the financing of national investment plans. So there was uh, some work that was done by some researchers in, in my institute and other in, in, the, in other institutes in Germany and in Austria, where we actually proposed that instead, instead, in addition to the, to the recovery, there should be a, a the, an attempt to finance a truly European investment plan. So actually European, pan-European, Investment. There was also a proposition, but this is that, that was just to, 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 to sort of uh, propose a possible way to actually do that. The main 
the main idea of the of the brief was really that focus should go from national to uh, pan-european investment the our our specific proposal was to to develop a, a, an ultra rapid train network to and to uh, to uh, develop smart grids and the uh, fundamental research that goes with uh, with those i mean i can give the reference to the to the brief if any uh, anybody is interested uh, but as we remain within a framework, and this will be necessar necessarily the case because Europe is not a federal state, uh, I repeat uh, for the second time, uh, we, we also need to think about the fiscal rules that Paul was quickly mentioning in his own presentation. We wrote a paper with Billy and, and Bridget Young a, a couple of uh, months, it came out a couple of months ago, where we tried to see what, what were the challenges in uh, concerning the European, the debate on the reform of European uh, 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 governance and the uh, macro uh, in, uh, in the macroeconomic part, we uh, we argue that we should have a a, a, a fiscal rule, a European fiscal rule that uh, stops the penalization, the bias against public investment. So that we propose that a golden rule would uh, e is implemented in Europe. That is an old idea that has been around for a while. This golden rule, given the current context, and this is where I will stop, should be a rule that takes an extensive definition of public investment. We saw during the past pandemic how much, much of the what we consider current ex public expenditure is as crucial for long-term long growth as physical investment. Think of health, think of education, and so on and so forth. So the idea would be to have a golden rule in which what is considered to be important for the uh, for the uh, uh, for for future growth is decided uh, pol uh, politically by uh, the, the parliament the commission and the uh, council and the uh, countries that implement expenditure in these sectors are actually uh, exempted uh, from the uh, rule and so uh, we should uh, focus, I repeat, not just on material physical investment, but more generally on immaterial public capital. Uh, maybe not everybody in the audience knows that this is a very good moment to have this discussion because the commission started last March, actually in March 2020, started a, re a consultation process on a possible revision of the European fiscal rule. And so this is the moment where these ideas should be discussed and uh, debated. Um, thank you very much for your attention and of course, ready to answer any questions. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Francesco. This was a very good um, review of uh, the European side of uh, fiscal policy with all its difficulties and maybe not that uh, massive size that you see in the US, but uh, still moving ahead. So with um, fiscal spending also on the green uh, recovery. So we have uh, still some time now to go to Q and A questions. Let me do that first. Maybe and if there are less, we run out of this and I will ask the speakers uh, how to well, somewhat to respond to the other speakers if we have still time, yeah? So let me just go to the Q and A questions. And there is, um, uh, I guess that's a question for uh, you know, like fuel taxes have lots of opposition in low and middle income countries. How can carbon tax income distribution impact be tackled? So uh, this uh, policy constraints of a tax, uh, particularly for low and middle income countries um, is one question. Uh, let me see, then we have another one. Um, yeah, that's uh, to Paul. Maybe I take those uh, two first. This is uh, a question by um, uh, Joe Brago, who's actually also one of the, uh, well, in the team of the World Bank report that we are working on. I have a question to Paul, please, in your point of view, what is the expected impact of this proposal on the relative capital cost for green investments, considering both those funded by the 
AIB and those not funded by the AIB and on the total returns of green bond holders. In other words, uh, that has asset market effects and affects the cost of capital if the, per if the central banks is uh, intervening in the uh, money or capital market by bonds. So this is basically a question to Paul and the first question to Dirk. Dirk, you want to answer first? I think the next one is not, no, it's just, it's for Nicoletto. I wait with that. Great. Um, so the literature on equity is, um, very, is very important. It has changed tremendously in the last uh, two years. Um, it used to be quite focused in the United States and in the United States, it is true that the um, low income households, they spend a higher proportion of their income on fuels. And as a result, uh, it can be unequitable to basis taxes in Europe that is approximately proportional. And in developing countries, which haven't traditionally been studied that much, it is um, it's the opposite. So um, particularly the situation is very clear for low income countries, higher income households spending a higher proportion than lower income households on their, of, their in, uh, of their consumption on fuels. And as a result, in those countries, it's it's straightforward that these price that these reforms are in equity improving. If one then additionally uses the revenue in a progressive way, and so we spend a lot of time on um, on quantifying how that can work, then um, uh, it's very progressive. The literature since then has moved on, and in the last two years, pointed out also that we need to take into account the general equilibrium effects of these reforms. Uh, if we do environmental taxation, the induced structural change, the structural change is very much the objective of that um, reform. And then the uh, ILO is showing that a, a low carbon structural change tends to induce a shift towards a slightly more labor intensive economy. And then when one combines these multi-region input output models used for that with household uh, with labor force service, one can see that this is also benefiting, especially the demand of low income labor. Uh, kind of a leading study for that by ILO and IDB last year. And when we then uh, um, take into account the impact of that, so of a shift towards slightly more labor intensive production, uh, then the relative returns to capital and labor get affected. And capital has a slightly lower return than compared to labor. And when we then con consider who is owning labor uh, factor, who is deriving the f factor income from labor, who is deriving the factor incomes from capital ownership, that becomes hugely important and changes the progressiveness of the reform by hitting higher income groups a lot more than what was previously assumed. So the uh, RFS, for example, have been showing that as a result, even in the United States, where we said previously that the problem that uh, from the household surveys that the concentration of fuels, uh, that actually the poor consume quite a lot of fuels, even in the United States, then the carbon tax would have net progressive impacts. So there is actually very little few countries where it wouldn't be progressive then. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't problems with individual fuels, um, for example, heating fuels or cooking fuels in countries, one needs to be quite careful about uh, about specificity of fuels, but the overall impact is to improve equity. That still is not solving polit that political economy can go completely the other way and that often uh, the reforms are not perceived equitably uh, efficient uh, uh, um, distribution enhancing at all. Um, uh, also partly because countries like in France have been using the revenues wrongly. Thank you, Dirk. Um, now I can guess we can let uh, Paul respond to the question on uh, the capital cost that um, Joe Paul Raga had. So, um, okay. Did you have a question, Paul? Yes, yes, I, I've, I've seen the question. Interesting question. Um, thanks, Joao. Um, so, the, the, the way I see it is that um, it, it, what I propose, this would be a, a program to finance public investment, right? Um, so the, I, I don't think uh, the EIB should do uh, in this context. Uh, it, it can, of course, but it should focus on public investment. Um, and then I, 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 I suspect that um, in this scheme, the EIB could actually profit from 
its AAA so that it could bow um, at conditions that are similar to um, the, the, the low risks that um, governments like um, German government um, can, can, can get, right? So in, in, from, when you look at it in this way, then um, clearly the capital cost for this kind of public investment would be relatively low under the present conditions <coughs> Um, that we, we find in the financial markets. Now, other public investments that are financed at the national level, right, by <clears throat> national governments would, might probably, depending on, on who is issuing the bonds, um, face um, less favorable conditions. And, and then, yes, this would be at a higher capital cost. But note that <clears throat> these are then government issues, right? Um, that um, we, we should consider differently from, from private um, issues. And, and, and clearly, private investments in, in, in green projects would, would face different capital costs. But I would like to add, finally here, that um, when you can um, engage in, in a massive public investment program, that is likely to lower um, the risk of private investment projects also, because I do believe that these public investment and private investment projects are quite complementary, right? Uh, so these private investments then can share uh, um, the, the fact that uh, there is such a public investment um, at relatively low risk, and, and, and that would also be beneficial for private investors. Okay. Thank yes, you. Thank you. I have a question for um, Nicoletta. Yes. Um, thank you very much. That's from Oriol uh, Codina, um, who finished his, his uh, PhD uh, <laughs> environmental um, questions of a transition from carbon intensive to less carbon intensive. Um, um, the energy sector. Thank you very much for your great presentation and for putting this compelling event together. I have a question regarding the output multiplier for Dr. Battini. What drives the higher multiplier for eco-friendly energy sources in your data? It would be great to hear more on this issue. Yeah, so Nicoletta, can you answer? Yes, so um, there are various factors that explain uh, what's going on here. And uh, the, the great discussion can be found in a lot of these sectoral studies on energy that we quote and that we try to uh, cross, you know, benchmark uh, our results against. And first of all, green activities tend to be more labor intensive than non-eco-friendly activities because they use far more uh, of the overall investment budget on hiring people, relatively less on acquiring land. If you're doing like fossil fuels, you have to acquire, you know, um, either land or permits for exploration and then drilling. And then, you know, there's a, a, a bunch of other things going on, either onshore or offshore. Uh, machines um, and supplies and energy itself. And in nuclear, which uses, of course, machinery, it's mostly you know, cement plant, and then there's some parts. Um, often countries that do nuclear have developed a supply chain domestically, and therefore they also become exporter of that, you know, of those parts. So it's a, a double whammy positive for the economy. The second level is that green activities imply a higher domestic content. For example, clean energy spending relies much more on economic activities taking place within the domestic economy, such as retrofitting homes or upgrading the electrical grid system locally, unless on imports and spending with conventional fossil fuel uh, sector. So that's, that's for energy. Um, uh, there's one thing that I would like to remark here, which is quite important. Our estimates are on CAPEX, they don't include OPEX. If we were to include OPEX, we would get even possibly higher multipliers because, uh, of course, to operate a power generation station that burns fossil fuels, a lot of countries who are importers of fuel 
uh, will have to import fuel to operate the machine. So the leakage, uh, you know, in operating a fossil fuel um, uh, apparatus are much higher than if, for example, even nuclear or, of course, solar, which comes from the sun directly. So the, the estimates we have here are actually underestimating the uh, multiplication effect of the uh, OPEX on top of capital. If you look at conservation, you know, the studies by Anthony and many others show that uh, conservation boosts the business or economy a lot and creates opportunities and income in hospitality, tourism, some of the areas which are very labor intensive. And this is quite contrary to spending in large agribusiness, for example, palm oil plantations or, you know, cocoa plantations, which are, you know, tend to be um, often much more um, concentrated with, you know, profits and returns just flying out of the country immediately. So just some of the reasons I'm going to explore more uh, more detail and provide more uh, matching sector studies in the paper. But I think uh, that's more or less the bottom line uh, of why this happened. Thank you. There's, uh, briefly, before I get to another bigger question, there's one additional question for Derek that came in there, which is hangs together with the tax, carbon tax. For something like a carbon tax, how do you prevent companies from moving emission producing activities to countries? which have lower or lesser regulations. So in other words, this uh, border adjustment problem. Um, how is this dealt with them? I think first it's important to keep in mind that the econometric literature on this problem should suggest it's small on the macro level so that uh, there isn't much evidence of significant uh, carbon leakage. Uh, but that's for the economy overall, for individual sectors there can be and uh, then countries have several options. One is to um, use what's called fee-based systems. Um, another one is called output-based rebates, and then the, you can shift to consumption-based carbon taxation. Uh, then there is the, also now the European Commission would like to introduce a uh, border carbon adjustment that is a more complex way of, of dealing, dealing with it. But for countries at different levels of uh, administrative capacity, there are solutions available for this problem. Um, one just needs to then design the policy carefully. Okay, there is one other question. I guess this is for Paul. Central banks do not only uh, do monetary policy, but also prudential oversight of the financial markets in the sense it would be advisable to have green prudential policy too. For example, counting green assets as tier one in bank capital requirements. So in other words, bolstering and you know, making some <laughs> the banks safer against them, um, the bank financial instability. So um, have you thought about this? Is that for me or is- Yeah, 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 Paul, for you. Oh, okay. Uh, well, as you know, um, in fact, that's one of the areas where central banks are making progress, right? Uh, the proposal that I formulated, um, I'm not sure central banks or the ECB will like it. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, the, the idea of using um, supervision as a tool um, to promote green um, investment, green activities that that has become quite popular among central bankers and also in, in Frankfurt um, and and in particular <laughs> um, there is now also lots of talk about um, how um, the ECB can tailor its uh, corporate bond buying program in 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 this way by 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 deciding whether or not to have certain companies that, that use a lot of um, carbon uh, or emit a lot of um, CO2 or, or use uh, fossil, fossil fuel, um, that, that they would not be buying these bonds. Not that this matters a great deal uh, for these companies directly, but in terms of um, signal that is made by the ECB, it's quite important. So I. I, I do think that um, here we should expect quite some progress and, and, and central banks have a tool there 
that is quite significant and that I can use to, to promote uh, a green economy. Thank you very much. I don't see, let me see, I can, yeah, so um, most questions have an, been answered, but I would like to give you an opportunity, the four of you, to respond or ask questions uh, for the others on the panel. So uh, now comes the well, time that you can uh, respond in some way, but I didn't want to do it earlier because it um, would have taken time. So any questions from your side to others in, your, in the panel? I did, don't have more QA questions at the moment, if I see this correctly. So, okay, yeah. let's go. I have a very quick question for Nicoletta. Uh, my question is, I mean, given the massive investment that is going to happen, is there a question of size? Is there a chance that the multiplier of this specific policy experiment of these months and next few years would be different because of the size? Uh, uh, so uh, my answer is, uh, I don't think so, because these uh, multipliers are, for example, solar, you need a certain amount of people to, you know, uh, set up a solar installation. Uh, the market is what it is in the years that we've analyzed, of course, it's evolved. So it's often been, you know, China dominating, for example, the photovoltaic. Uh, but if you look at wind, and this is, of course, uh, an aggregate multiplier for solar, wind, uh, you know, another green technology. So because of the lack of data, you couldn't just, you know, slice and just look at solar multipliers. So it's a bit of, you know, it's a bit of a mixed bag of uh, technologies. But, you know, from, from what we know, some of these technologies are re relatively kind of new. I mean, they're 10 years old. So and, and the market is pretty much settled. What changes the price, and maybe, you know, the efficiency, the quality of some of these this parts, but not... Uh, the labor content. Um, I think uh, so. I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect that uh, on nuclear. You know, the data it goes back further, and of course, there are new generation reactors now. The third, fourth generation reactors are also smaller reactors. You can now operate a reactor from a ship. You know, to you know directly in some remote areas, and those will have different uh, employment content. I expect. Um, but um, you know, I, I would assume that it's not the fact of the scale because um, you know we, we're still um, we need to transition completely, you know, to a new system, and so um, and we need to do it quickly. So you know, we have to have people work in parallel. We don't have you know people work sequentially if, if we are to really make the transition happen. So I would expect it to be the same or even you know, potentially more because of the great structural transformation that we need. Uh, and pay would also be, you know, probably higher because there'll be like bottlenecks. You know, the demand is the demand for, for supply parts and parts uh, is gonna be really high. And, and that is gonna create, you know, better paid jobs in all these sectors. They have to happen all at once. So maybe not the best answer, but you know, just a gut feeling. Any other questions from one to the other or comments or leftover comments that you have in your mind and couldn't uh, put forward yet? No? I, yes, the, I think then we can. Oh, no, there's another chat question. Let me see. Oh, um, I get some warning that we are running out of time. <laughs> so let me see. There's one other chat question. Um, well, is it all not <laughs> well? Too little, too late, given the environmental catastrophes that humans are creating. So this is a big question. I think we need uh, another few hours for this. Uh, this is discussed as well. So among uh, well, the policymakers, so forcefully and speedy, should they uh, move forward. Um, 
But um, if anybody wants to give a short answer of a sentence or two, so you're welcome. Anybody ready? I saw there's yeah. a question by another question as well by Yanis. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, to Arno's question, absolutely true. I mean, we, we knew since 1970 what was going on and we haven't acted. So now we are, you know, very high risk territory. Um, all we can do is to try to do, do what we have to do. Science says it's still feasible. Um, you know, political economy is, is a different story. On Yanis, I think in our study, we don't uh, account for, uh, you know, other costs. We just look at the multiplication GDP. Um, but of course, the green ones have positive effects on the planet and the non-eco-friendly have negative effects on the planet. So I guess that was my answer. Yeah, so there is uh, increasingly a tendency now uh, among the academ academics and different disciplines and scientists actually do the interaction of uh, actually ecosystems and uh, the green recovery uh, much better, studies is much better than before. So uh, this is a big question, but I think we leave it now um, as it is. Uh, anybody from the panel want to have a quick uh, response or answer or what? If I may. Yes. On on uh, Onu's point, uh, I think we have we see a very significant change at the moment. That uh, it used to be that finance ministries didn't want to act on this very much. Now we have almost every week a finance ministry calling out for get, wanting support on climate fiscal policies um, um, on climate monetary. I believe that has also been uh, the central banks have uh, a lot more active, um, as Paul pointed out. And I guess that at the moment, the problem used to be that the countries weren't so interested and, uh, and the literature was there pointing out that there's, that there's something we can do, but the countries didn't really want to. Now, I believe we have the opposite problem. We have countries that are actually very interested. And, and in terms of on the, on the analytical side, uh, there aren't many uh, people who are walking the line between the analytics and uh, wanting to uh, to respond to these country requests. So at the moment, it is a big problem of actually advising all these countries that are asking questions and finding people who can respond to that. Uh, there, uh, there's a very significant need for macroeconomists to be wanting to help those countries that are now signaling the willingness to act. I think we have uh, gone through all the questions and we have uh, picked your brain. And I must say, it was always my. There's some more comments? No. Somebody had comments? No. It was always my dream, so to speak, to have you guys all together here, sometimes at the new, at the new school. And it would not have, have happened with, uh, well, traveling, you see. And because everybody of you has so many uh, different appointments and. Uh, uh, so many different uh, well, um, places to go. and But with these online um, I mean, technology now, and um, that was brought about by <laughs> pandemic meltdown as well. So uh, we having a much better, can have a much better team together and to cooperate and to do brainstorming. And it was wonderful to have you all here on this panel. And uh, Hopefully the next time it will be some more in person with where we can have some drink and some food, but this time it will be not possible. So I thank you very much for um, well, joining us. And I thank also the SIPA staff to organize this uh, uh, panel discussion. And uh, we will have, uh, I think you don't mind if you put these uh, slides on uh, the SIPA website. So the uh, other students are, uh, researchers can look at this. So if uh, um, you have some objections, then let us know. But otherwise, I think we can just take, uh, to take this. Um, I think, yes, so um, we hope to see you sometimes um, well, another time, but to getting together though, uh, with all the uh, different appointments, that's probably difficult. But this way, it really worked perfectly well. So we thank you very much. Yeah. And we thank also Bye. the team. If, uh, thank you, really. Bye bye. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. bye, -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.